Hi, I'm Laura Watkinson and I want to talk to you today about a couple of books that I've recently worked on, um, translating from Dutch into English that I've really enjoyed. Uh, this is The Order of the Golden Lion by Dorothée de Roy and Ticker by Brenda Heines. And they're both books that I love because I really love sort of fantasy stories and ghost stories. And in the case of Dorothée's books, great fantasy books with brilliant maps in the beginning so you sort of follow the route of the characters as they're traveling around and Dorothea's books also very close to my heart because it's very close to my house geographically the locations that she writes about in the first chapter which is when it's set in the real world in our world are just outside my house so I could picture exactly what everything looked like and I'm going to read you just the first chapter of her story today which covers some of those locations and uh, I'm going to put in some pictures as well so that you can see what I see. The Order of the Golden Lion, Chapter One. Don't look back, said Lucy's mum, pulling her over the bridge by her arm. The lights around the arch of the bridge shone as usual, reflecting in the dark water of the canal. There was a crescent moon in the sky and the city was silent and deserted, apart from Lucy and her mum, who were running as fast as they could along the canal and away from their home, the grand house with the heads on Kaisersgracht in the centre of Amsterdam. Lucy didn't know what they were running from. Her mum had just woken her up. She told Lucy to quickly get dressed and come with her. There was no time to explain they were in serious danger. And less than 10 minutes later, the two of them were racing through the streets, across the bridge, down a side street and onto the next canal. Lucy was cold. She'd pulled on a pair of jeans and a jumper, but she hadn't thought to grab a coat. It was May after all, but it suddenly felt much colder outside than normal and a strange ominous mist hung over the canal. Lucy ran even faster, hoping it would warm her up. She followed her mum as they ran towards another canal, the single. In spite of her mum's warning, Lucy glanced back over her shoulder. She could see shadowy figures, just outlines, as if the darkness itself were on their heels. They were near the single now, and Lucy's mum pulled her into a doorway. Mum, what's happening? What's going on? Lucy was starting to feel really scared. No time to explain, Lucy. I need you to listen closely. Lucy saw the serious look on her face. No matter what happens to me, she said, holding Lucy firmly by the shoulders, you must promise not to come after me. What do you mean? Where are you going? There are too many of them. Lucy's mum looked back, scanning the streets for their pursuers. We have to split up and you need to follow the path. What path? Mum, we've got to call the police. Lucy, my love, there's nothing the police can do about this. It's important that you do exactly as I say. Do you promise? Lucy nodded. You remember that secret cave? Lucy knew exactly what her mum meant. The cave was hidden under the statue of the author Malta Tuli on the bridge over the single canal. Very few people in Amsterdam knew it was there. Lucy's family had lived in the city for generations. Her grandfather was a bridge keeper though and he knew about the secret room. And Lucy had been there with her mum before to fetch things from the big crates that were stored down there. When you went down the rickety stairs from the street, you came to a small old wooden door. You could see it from the street if you knew where to look, but no one expected to find a secret cave right in the middle of the city. Go straight there and make sure no one sees you. The moment you're inside, open this book. Don't dawdle and don't be scared. Lucy's mum thrust an old weathered book into her hands. The cover was made of brown leather and written upon it in ornate gold letters were the words, The Book of the Worlds. There's no time to explain why you have to do it. Here, just read this when you get there, she said, handing Lucy an envelope with a purple and gold wax seal. Everything you need to know is in this letter. Lucy saw tears in her mum's eyes. We have to split up now. I'll make sure they follow me. As soon as they do, run to the bridge. And remember, don't come after me, Lucy. That's absolutely essential. Don't look back. Just follow the path and you'll get to where you need to be. Lucy gave her mum a hug. Her mum kissed her and held Lucy's face in her hands. I hope this day would never come, but you've got it in you. I've always known that. They stood there for a moment, and then Lucy's mum ran across the bridge. Three or four shadows immediately darted after her. At a furious speed, they swooped above the mist, chasing after Lucy's mum, who was making a commotion as she ran along the street. She kicked cans, whooped and shouted anything to attract their attention. Lucy had no time to think. She had to do as her mum had said. Glancing back, she sprinted the short distance of the bridge across the single. Trying to blend in with the surroundings, she crossed the bridge to reach the entrance to the cave and then dived down the rickety stairs from the street to the waterside. Nervously, she placed her foot on the old decaying wood. She heard a loud, high-pitched scream. Lucy instantly recognised her mum's voice. She was in danger. 
Startled, Lucy dropped both the book and the litter, then landed right on the edge of the wooden deck beside the canal, which the water was gently lapping against. Quickly, Lucy ran down to grab the book. But then a sudden gust of wind blew the letter away. Lucy tried to catch it. She just managed to grab the wax seal with her fingertips, but it broke off. The letter flew away before her very eyes and straight into the water. Lucy was just wondering whether to jump in after it when she felt a sudden chill. Startled, she looked up and saw a wave of mist coming her way. The letter was floating off and she made a promise to her mum she had to get inside. There was no time to hesitate. Lucy swiped the book from the walkway and turned the brass door handle. She pulled the door open and stepped into the cave. Then she huddled in a corner, hugging the book tightly to her chest. She couldn't think clearly. Her breath came in pants and gasps as she heard her mum's words echoing inside her head. The moment you're inside, open this book, don't dawdle and don't be scared. In the darkness, Lucy carefully placed the book on her lap. She ran her fingers over the old wrinkled leather and opened the cover. It creaked as if it hadn't been opened for years. The cave under the bridge was suddenly bathed in light. What if her pursuers saw it? Lucy tried to shut the book, but it refused to close. As soon as she had opened the Book of the Worlds, all kinds of things had come up out of it. Just like a pop-up book, she saw a landscape, a green field with a gnarled tree. Beside the tree, there was a winding stream and a sandy path led straight across the field of grass. This book was not like any other book Lucy had ever seen. The sudden light, the field, the path, it seemed so real. It was almost as if the blades of grass and the leaves on the tree were moving. Lucy sank her face into the book to take a closer look. She blinked as she smelled the scent of fresh grass. This was impossible. As she tried to grasp what was happening, the tree started to grow from the size of her thumb to the length of her forearm and higher and higher until it reached the ceiling of the cave. She could run her hands through the grass that now surrounded her. It felt cool and juicy between her fingers. A breeze blew across her face. She gazed around in fear. Everything in the book was becoming larger and larger. The landscape was actually coming to life. Lucy heard birds in the distance and the water splashing in the stream. It even felt as if her feet were getting wet. When she looked down, she couldn't believe her eyes. The water from the stream was flowing out of the book and over the floor. The landscape had grown into a life-size scene by now. The grass was up to her ankles and dust blew up from the sandy path. There was a bird sitting on a branch of the tree. It had beautifully coloured feathers and it looked curiously at Lucy. Lucy couldn't make any sense of what was happening. She wanted to go back outside to her mum, but she knew she couldn't. She'd made a promise. She had to follow the path and then she would get to where she needed to be. Hesitantly, Lucy slid one foot over the edge of the book. As she walked up to the dusty path, she heard the crunch of sand and stones beneath her feet. Astonished, she looked at her surroundings. In the distance, she saw hills, forests and lakes. She felt the spring sunshine on her skin, warm and inviting. You could hardly imagine a greater contrast with the chilly mist in Amsterdam. She looked back but there was nothing left behind her, certainly not a cave. How was this possible? Lucy spun around, but all she could see was the new world she had just stepped into. The cave had vanished. The darkness, the pursuers, but also her mum, all of them were gone. And the second book that I'm going to read an excerpt from uh, is Ticker by Brenda Haynes, and it means the same in English, Ticker, as in heart. Um, it's a story with a lot of heart and with a very cool ghost. I'm going to read a few excerpts from the beginning pages of the book. And it's told from the point of view of two characters, Boyd and Elias. It starts with Boyd. My skateboard rattles along the trail through the woods on my way home. The bright rays of light from the setting sun draw lines across the path. My legs tingle as the board vibrates on the stones. I'm going faster and faster, but my mind's still on the photo in my pocket. If I push too fast, it will get creased, and I really don't want that to happen. Since the fire at Grandpa's place, he has hardly anything left from the past. So I came up with an idea. A surprise as a small attempt to make up for the devastating mistake I made three weeks ago, which cost him his home and all his precious belongings. I press the burnt photo to my thigh. The bumpy track gives way to tarmac. I can go even faster here. When I get to the T-junction, I can take the long route to the right or go left across the little bridge where cyclists can pass over the motorway. There are metal railings running along the side of the bridge. I set a little challenge for myself. When I get to the slope at the end of the bridge, I have to jump up onto the railing with my board, keep my balance and slide on down. With a bit of luck, I'll be able to do a backflip too before landing on the smooth road surface below. I choose left and steer my board towards the bridge. I run up the first bit. The cars race past beneath me. I ride my board across the entire straight part of the bridge until I'm almost at the slope down. The wind whooshes past my head and my cap only just stays on. I go even faster and I jump up with my board towards the railing. In a perfect arch, the bottom of my board lands on the metal bar. Yes! I lean forward a little and speed up faster, faster, faster. 
just as I'm starting to grin, I slow, suddenly lose my balance. No idea why it happens. Wind or perhaps a bump on the railing. My body twists and before I can grab something, I fall. It's high. I know only too well how high it is. As I hear the screeching tyres of a car braking, all kinds of thoughts shoot through my mind. Grandpa, Mum and Dad, my dog Nero's big head. And then in slow motion, I see myself hanging there with my head pointing towards the motorway. First, the board smashing down onto the verge, the photo falling out of my pocket, and then my forehead touching the tarmac. And after that, everything's black. Elias. The nights in the hospital are always the same. The nurses walk their usual routes along the corridors and whisper stuff about the other kids on the ward or what they're going to do at the weekend. They go to all the beds, checking the IVs, blood pressures and heart rates and helping some patients go to the toilet. Usually I wake up two or three times, but it's different tonight. Someone taps me on the shoulder. It takes me a while to switch out of sleep mode. My head starts up more slowly than I want it to. I rub my clammy forehead. Nurse Suzanne's face appears close to mine in a blurry haze. Elias, wake up, she whispers. What? I croak. Don't worry, everything's okay. When someone says don't worry, that's when you really start to worry, particularly when you're in hospital and it's the middle of the night. I try to sit up. Now you just stay lying there, nice and comfortable. I've got some news. She pauses for a moment. There's a heart for you. Back to Boyd. You do not want to know all the things I saw last night. After I fell and everything went black, I woke up for just a moment. In a haze, I saw flashes of an ambulance and the cars on the motorway were standing still. Then it went black again. Much later, I suddenly came back. It was so weird. I was watching myself from a distance while my body lay on a stretcher covered by a sheet and being pushed through the hospital into an operation table. I was really woozy and what I saw made me feel sick. My body was lying there with a bunch of doctors standing around it. I swear they pulled something out of it. I ran away, gagging. This guy came out with a cooler. I heard these doctors discussing it, saying that the extraction had been a success. Gross. Yuck. Ack. Help, I thought. Normally, when something bad happens, I don't want to think about it again, like the fire at Grandpa's house. I go to the snack bar in the corner and order a hot dog with so much sauce that it instantly makes you forget all your problems. But not even a hundred hot dogs could help me now. There's two things I know for sure. One, I'm apparently dead. Two, I'm some kind of ghost, because when I ran away after seeing the cooler, I walked straight through an old lady. Although it wasn't exactly walking, more like staggering. I, I don't get it. What on earth is going on? What are they going to do with my heart after taking it out? I am dead, and it's my own stupid fault. Who rides a skateboard along the railing of a bridge? Yep, that'll be you, Boyd, you stupid idiot, you crazy fool, you dumbass, that's what you are. Feeling mad at myself, I stomp up and down the hospital corridor. How is this possible? I can still smell, see and feel everything. But no one can see, feel or smell me. Why is that? I never really thought about death or where you go when you're dead. But this certainly wasn't what I was expecting. And yeah, it's kind of dark to start with. But it's a story that really lightens up. And Boyd and Elias help each other out in a fantastic way and there's a beautiful resolution to the story so this is another story that's very close, close to my heart I've, I've loved doing both of these books and i hope to see them published in english one day soon okay thank you